Thank you. And thank you, everybody. I need to start sharing my screen. So I want to see where it is. Uh, allow me to, to sort myself technically here so that mm -hmm. I can be able to share the screen. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh -huh. So let me see. And now I was supposed to have shared this with the with Tulel much earlier. Are you able to see my screen? Good morning. Morning, Dr. We are able to see your screen. You can go ahead. Just yes, so a slide, slide mode. Thank you. Yes, I'm putting it. I think uh, where I am, the connectivity is not the best in the world. So is it now going to? Yes, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so you can, uh, please, you can stop me along the way. Uh, and mine will be an overview of what the ministry and the government is planning and thinking, specifically on digitization of health information systems in uh, Kenya. Sorry, this is the wrong one. I think I've shared the wrong screen. Sorry. Uh, to, to see. Uh, because this is a journey to a comprehensive national health information system in Kenya with the aim of achieving universal health coverage. So mine will be an overview and then uh, Jared will go into the details of the blood management information system. But we thought it is important for all the participants to know that the government is moving towards developing a comprehensive national health information system and has made several steps towards achieving that. So this is how my presentation will be conducted. I will start with the background and then take you through the attempts at digitization. Then the vision that we are now looking at. And of course, uh, moving down towards the policy environment and the legal environment that is in place. I will talk about the solution that is already in place. And then eventually some few lessons learned for the purpose of all of us to know where we are at the moment. So we do appreciate the fact that uh, digitization is the way to go. And on your left, you can see that is the ideal situation where every data collection is digitized and we move away from the outdated way that we are basically dealing with papers towards uh, digitizing everything and also advancing our care towards a remote consultation with the use of telehealth and telemedicine and other technologies so that we can be able to reach the places where we do not have the skills that may be required and that people can be able to access those skills however remote they are but the biggest challenge has always and will always remain which way should we take towards achieving the ideal session but i want to report that uh, by the end of this presentation you will notice that a lot has already taken place. We have chosen the direction that you want to take towards that. Quickly to take you to the history of HIS in Kenya. This is the health information systems in Kenya. I would like to state that uh, this thinking started way long time ago, eight years after Kenya, uh, 12, uh, 15 years after Kenya gained its uh, independence in 1972. And there have been a lot of uh, effort particularly between 1998 and 2003 towards creation of a national system. But in 2003, that is when we start to augment our health information systems because we started to introduce vertical responses, disease specific or driven by partners or driven by programs. And I think we have so many exam examples that we can quote, for example, the, the lab management information system purely focusing on lab and nothing else. We have so many others, including IRIS, which we know focuses only on the health information system for human resources, and so many others that we have come across, including the so-called uh, Kenya EMR that has always been focusing on HIV field. We have TB for TB. So there are so many examples. 
all those ones were either disease specific or introduced because of a program need or because of a partner who was driving a particular direction. And the fast forward in 2010 is when we introduced the so-called DHIS, initially at the cost in Kuala and quickly to take care of the whole country. But notice that uh, because of where we are right now, the internet subscription in Kenya in 2017 is almost 30%. And by 2018, it has ju it jumped up to 41%. This penetration has since increased. I did not get time to get the most recent uh, statistics. But I'm putting this across because this tells you that we can be able to leverage on existing uh, internet uh, distribution in the country to do much more that we have been able to do. The mobile ownership is very high in Kenya and it's almost universal, partly because some people own more than one phone, therefore pushing the ownership much, much higher. And you can see the smartphone penetration is at 21%. Again, these smartphones can be used to do much more than just uh, call and send messages. We can be able to use them as tools towards uh, actualizing the health information systems. And of course, in Kenya, there's already a lot of attempts towards uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And in Kenya, specifically, the changes, as I said, took place in Kenya when vendors and partners introduced applications in the health sector. But by and large, the, the sector has always lagged behind. And some of the vendors and the partners, what they introduced were separate forms of solutions, like hospital management information systems, electronic patient records, which I think most of us are uh, conversant with the electronic medical records. This is a fairly advanced one laboratory, data reporting systems, supply chains, operations, and of course, also including the mobile applications that have been in place uh, over this time from 2010. And as you will see, this has led us to a lot of challenges because one of the things that has come out of this is the fact that now we have multiple and disparate systems. What I mean by disparate is that systems with limited capacity to exchange health information in a meaningful way. And you will see slightly later, I believe I put that slide of what that means. We've come up with what we think are uh, digitization for collection of data, but they are mainly m and &E systems. Most of the people have gone out to the field, looked at the reporting tools that we use. Uh, most of them have been Christen, MOH something, 715, 731, all those ones. And when they convert them into digitization, to them, they have actually digitized the health system, which is not true because that's mainly, I mean, M&E tool. This has led to a lot of vendor locking. And in some instances, it has made uh, some vital health data to be lost. And I think uh, blood transfusion services can attest to that because of the problem of vendor locking. And of course, when you buy something from a vendor, you have to bear in mind that those systems were not designed for Kenya, the processes are from other countries, and therefore you have to change the way you do your processes to conform to the processes in the system, as opposed to the system being conforming to the processes within the country. And of course, when you want to change those systems, you always land in a lot of challenges because the people who develop them are not locally available, and therefore you have to wait for months before that can happen. While still, if the vendor has gone under or for some reason is not interested in working with you, you either have to pay very heavily or you end up losing everything. And we've gone to facilities where you have these systems which are in place, but nobody is no longer is anymore using them. So these have been standalone systems. And as I said, of course, with the loss of data, you can always be sure that there is inability to use data for decision making, yet the whole world is moving towards use of data for innovations as new as data now is considered the new oil. Of course, this has again led to poor accountability, misuse of health data. Some of our health data as we speak right now are in a phase which does not meet the requirements of the law, which I'll be talking about later, and the absence of remote healthcare, which has really affected this country. So in 2018, there was a survey which was conducted in Kenya and we surveyed 5,013 facilities. I put this to demonstrate what I meant by disparate health information systems. 
Uh, and in all of them, the 5,000 facilities that we sampled, all of them had a form of a health information system. One of them had 12 different types of health information systems, 12, each independent of the other. And if you are the med sub of that facility and you want to know about finances, you have to call the finance department because they have a dif different type of system. If you want to know how many people were discharged yesterday, you have to call somebody in the inpatient to tell you. In other words, totally independent of each other. But this is the consequence of the way that we have been approaching health information systems in Kenya. And more, worse still, there are some places where a lot of solutions which have been there, the health information systems, none of them was functional. It being led by IFIT, this one was dead, so the computers were there, but nobody was using it. You can see in that list, all those ones had been developed, but nobody was using them. A very uh, unfortunate scenario, bearing in mind that uh, people have injected resources. But then fast forward, now what is the vision that the ministry and the Kenya government is trying to come up with? It is a comprehensive, digitized health information system that exceeds the expectations of the citizens of Kenya. The key word here is comprehensive, it is digitization, and exceeding the expectations and the citizens of Kenya. And I want to tell you, we've made major strides, as you will see as I move ahead. But even as we think about where we are going, we have to remember that we have more than 13,000 health facilities in Kenya that will at one time need to be all digitized. And the focus right now is at level four and level five facilities. So in total for the public sector level four facilities, there are about 355. So we are focusing on those ones. And level five facilities in the public sector, there are about 14. And of course, we have to make sure that uh, the level six facilities Dr. Sitene, since we, we've lost you, can you hear us? Hello, Dr. Sitene. Okay. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, we've lost Dr. Sitene uh, as he was giving us that overview on um, leveraging on ICT to improve uh, efficiency in provision of health in the country. Um, I will uh, now uh, can see I can acknowledge uh, that uh, Dr. Evans Kamuri has uh, logged in. Um, as uh, we earlier said, that he is going to make a uh, a presentation, and um, I would like to take this opportunity and uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Evans Kamuri, uh, who will give us his presentation. Dr. Evans Kamuri is the CEO of the Kenyatta National Hospital. Uh, welcome, Dr. Tari, if you can hear me. Thank you, thank you, I can hear you today. Hello? Yes, yes, Dr. Ari, let me project uh, your presentation quickly. Uh, first, as you project, uh, I want to take this opportunity to, to thank the organizers and also to, to thank uh, uh, Dr. Nduko Kilonzo for inviting me to, to give uh, this um, presentation. Uh, first, uh, it's a, a very interesting in, in, uh, uh, topic about the accountability and the visibility of blood and blood components. The question that we should ask ourselves is accountability, in, is it in terms of, um, in terms of uh, 
whether the, the blood is being used or misused or accountability in terms of the cost or in terms of the revenue it is supposed to, to generate. I don't know whether I can manage the, the, the presentation from my side next. Okay, thank you, Dad. Let me move slides for you. Okay. Yes, please. So um, I'm supposed to look at uh, the costing of blood, and uh, sometimes when we talk about blood, we, we really don't know whether we are talking about blood as a, a blood or blood as a component or blood as a drug. Uh, but uh, for these purposes, uh, we'll assume blood products uh, are therapeutic substances that we are using in our body and the, the product that plays a very critical role in health and healthcare delivery. Most of the time we have been using it as a, as a commodity, but uh, we know the role the blood really takes in our, in our system and in terms of the surgical uh, care, oncological care, children uh, care, and also uh, especially in the sum of the disorders like sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, and other inborn errors of uh, immunity. So basically, next, the, the blood uh, is a very important component. It's only that maybe we've not been uh, handling it with that level of importance. Next. If you look at blood in our essential medicine, next, this is actually shows that uh, blood plays a very important and major role in, uh, the, um, in the, our health uh, delivery system. And that's what we need to ask ourselves. If it is this important, are we handling it the actual way? If we can buy drugs, the question, the big question in the house is, can we also buy, if we can buy drugs, can we buy blood? If we can uh, sell drugs, can we, can we uh, sell blood? This is the question that I would pose and ask people to have it in their mind as we discuss why or how we should. Next. We are just showing the, how uh, blood is an essential product uh, and it, we can we get it obviously from the human origin and uh, and the, what we derive from it, the substitutes, et cetera, et cetera. Next. Next, we know that uh, prod, blood can be made into very many other products, especially uh, on need arise basis. You can extract uh, remnants from it. You can package it in different formats. And uh, of course, that tells you why it is actually a very essential product, especially when we are talking about uh, the, the strategic plan of Kenya to achieve the universal health coverage, it is something that we really, really need to be given a certain thought. And also, while we are talking about um, SDGs, when we are talking about sustainable development goals, uh, we need to factor in blood and blood product as one of the uh, very essential parts and essential commodities that needs to be considered. Next. Now, when we talk about transfusion, we, I will talk about in Kenyatta. Knowing Kenyatta is the apex, is the level six, uh, which provides specialized uh, services to patients all over Kenya and in the region, East African region. Uh, we are currently, it's documented that we are 1,800 bed capacity, but most of the time we are operating at 2,000 and 2,000 up to 2,300. And uh, this is the, uh, the largest uh, referral uh, facility in the neighborhood and in Africa among. However, that also tells you that when we talked about blood, we, the, we are the largest uh, national consumer. Since also in terms of the health workers, we have the highest number of specialists. And uh, that tells you now that we are also the highest number of consumer. We have around 24 theaters and 50 wards. All these are actually people who are consuming blood and blood products. So that can tell you as a facility, we are, we are the largest among the producer and the, also the consumer. Next. If we just look at a snapshot of our consumption of blood, last month, on the, the, the last weeks of September, we consumed 
1047 points or units. If you look at October uh, this year, we consumed 1966. And if you look at uh, November again this year, this is factual 2534. And you can see uh, this, although we are talking about these numbers, you can imagine. Uh, the numbers are coming back. If you are again operating at full scale pre-COVID, the consumption was still uh, higher than that. And now the consumption is going up as time goes on, especially because now we, we had also started going down when we were declared a, a referral. But uh, still, people are still coming back to the normal usual. At the moment, at the moment in the hospital, we are about um, 1,900, it's between 1,800 admitted. So despite us being purely referral, the numbers are still going back to normal. And that can tell you that there are, the consumption of uh, blood is still, uh, the demand is still high. Next. Again, this is uh, a narrative of where, how do we get blood? You can see my uh, unit, the Kenyatta BTU, we, we got that. Uh, and we also got from NTBTS. And the and KNBTS, we got uh, in September, we got five October. And with the DUCOS effort, you can see the number of um, uh, units we are now getting has started increasing, and there's a lot of engagement. There is also other private partners' engagement in, in matters of sharing blood. And this is the spirit we want to create that we can have a cohort, we can have um, a well distributed way of sharing. Uh, this commodity. But uh, if you see the red part, there is still a huge, huge deficit that we really need to think of. And we really need to think of how to bridge that gap. Next. So what does my unit, what role that do we play? Can H uh, blood bank or blood transmission is, is to act as the final link between the donor and the recipient. Assigned activities by the national surveillance include compatibility testing, storage, and hemovigilance. And when we look at the costing of uh, blood, what we start need to think now is the compatibility testing the, the, and the storage. All these, who pays for what? And when we talk about cost and the cost of blood as a commodity, we need to start and we need to look at a chain from vein to vein. When you look at the blood, when it's in the patient's vein and the blood up to when it gets to the, do the recipient vein, we need to look at the cost implication of that process. As we said, the shortage of blood supply has resorted to blood collection, which is actually an expensive labor intensive venture. And this, we still also give it freely. And uh, because we have to give it freely, we also have to make sure it's safe, efficacious, and adequate. And this has actually costed us a lot because we have to organize those drives so that we can have enough of uh, those, um, those uh, commodities. So as I'm saying, if you look at what we put in from the uh, donor, even if it is a free will, uh, willing giver and uh, willing recipient, we still also have to look at uh, the cost implication in, 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 in both sides. Next. So when we talk about costing and valuing blood, we need to look at costing. And uh, most of the studies that have been done in terms of costing have been based on either acquisition costs material costs, labor costs, and even general production costs. When we look at um, acquisition cost, is that process, how much do you use before you get that blood? What is the giving set? What is the blood bag, et cetera, et cetera. When we talk about material cost, is the process, the screening of that blood, the storage of that blood, the, 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 um, the making sure the, the fridges and all those, those are the, the material costs. When we talk about labor, a minimum of four personnel are used in, 
in uh, acquisition and delivery of this blood. All these are human uh, work, uh, health workers. We have the nurses, we have the perfectionists, we have the lab person, we have the, the doctor who is administering and who is ordering, and we also have the lab person who is uh, organizing. All these are factors we have to, to do when we are talking about costing and valuing of blood. And which means that uh, the assignment of value and cost should include one, the stakeholders involvement to identify their direct expenses, overheads, how much they are using, and also their locations of the overheads. This may also make us now involve other private institutions and insurances so that they can also be involved in this process of uh, acquisition and costing. That is people like NHIF, people like uh, private uh, enterprises, et cetera, et cetera, insurances, other private insurances. We must identify patient's level of activity and blood product data to ensure tracking of all produced blood uh, products. What I'm saying in this, we also need to start developing a system. And uh, after talking to Nduko severally, we want in a way we can be tracking how much, uh, as I said, from vein to vein, you can track a blood movement. Where is it moving to? Where is it stuck? So that even when it is being used, it is being used into the appropriate way. Then we need to map blood product service costs. That's what I'm trying to. This would also contribute to an applied value of each unit, such that when we say we have consumed 2,000 units, in terms of the monetary terms, in, if an economist is addressing that issue, if a strategist is uh, projecting the future, how do we go about saying the value is ABC? Next. Therefore, the cost centers in blood collection will include donor mobilization, recruitment, and management. One of the things we also need to look at now what, what is it in it for the donor? When we are, we are wooing somebody to donate blood, what is it in for them? Now that we are not paying for their blood, we need to look at it so that one, we either motivate them or two, the, the, we must give them something that they will look forward to doing it the next time in terms of sustainability. We must also look at, um, uh, again, since it is, um, and what I mean is that when we want to motivate them, we need to start thinking about, I went to India for this blood, uh, and I went to a, a, a team of people called Hindu, Hindu uh, blood. And what they do to their donors, they, once you become their donor, you are put in a database, and you are, they give you an insurance cover for that one year. That is one of the motivation. We need to look, at, they, have, they have negotiated a package for those donors. We need to start thinking of how such donors can be uh, included in that cost implication because we are not paying them. Then they are normally given certificate, appreciation certificate, so that you can actually use that certificate either in terms of uh, your CV or something to show that you, you care about the society. And then they are normally given a surety that in the event that you get sick and you need blood, we will not be buying blood. We will actually automatically, because you are in the database, we will be giving you. And then they, they are assured over an annual basic medical checkup. With this, you can now cover the cost element of the, um, uh, the donor. This is some of the issues that we need to consider when we are considering the donor. The cost of collection, again, that's the, the issue of the blood, the staffing, the phlebotomy, ACC, ACC, the processing, the storage. This one I had said, these are some of the costs that we, we need to factor in and we need to look at where the compensation for the same will come to whoever who is uh, donating. Next, Hemato hemovigilance, the issue of assessing when we have given blood and for example, the side effects, 
who takes care of that cost? And I'm talking this from now and not from a doctor's point of view. I want to look at it from an administrator point of view. We need to look at now who takes that burden, who takes that uh, financial burden. And because the hospital setup is not optimized for blood collection, blood availability and cost are affected by a number of factors. One of the things that we get is the efficiency and the cost of small volume collection. The cost that you get, and that's why it is sometimes cheaper to do blood drives where people come because now you, you act on the economy of scale. The reliance on mobilization group patients and relatives, this has been a work, but it is very unreliable. And most of the time, some of the blood that we really mobilize do that is not is not viable. And sometimes you don't have a system to tell them the five out of the seven you donated is not viable. These or these eventually end up giving us a, a acute shortage of blood. And some of these factors are some of the ones that really also drive the production cost uh, to be very high, especially when you consider a, a single unit. Next. So if you look at the statistics, the average cost of unit of blood in Kenya is 10,000. This is by the study on 2017. This is up from the USD 66 that was calculated uh, feature uh, in uh, 2011. And when you look at other uh, countries, the UK, the average is about uh, for a pint is 22,000 Kenya shilling equivalent. And uh, if you look, for the part cell is 33,600. When you look at the price of a component with the cost of a fresh is platelet as high as between 30 and 40. And again, this is per unit. This can tell you that actually the cost of blood is something that we need to look at it. Either we use the, uh, the costing analysis in terms of what we call bottoms up, Either we micro cost it and so that we can cost each, each, and, every, each and every input that uh, we are factoring in so that we can actually be strategically able to provide what needs to be done in terms of availability and in terms of the sustainability of the blood supply. Next. Next slide. So, the cost of blood can be mitigated. How do we go about it? And as I've said earlier, we need to involve all the stakeholders. We need to start looking at NHIF. We need to look at start looking at uh, cost recovery. How do institutions recover now that we really don't want to buy blood from patients? And also, we also need to think, if we were to put systems where patients can still start selling blood to us, at what cost will we be buying? And uh, what are the, some of the factors? And if you are to buy, if you are to buy uh, a blood which, are, which was HB11 and another one HB16, how, what will be the cost, for example? I'm just saying, if somebody was to sell for you, and then what will be the system where we can be ensuring somebody does not have shortage of airtime in Nakuru and besides now, let me go and have my, donate blood so that I can buy airtime or uh, I can see the runner online. Then says uh, he gets to Nairobi and he has no fuel. He has to go again and be, be uh, give some blood so that he can um, get some money. So we need to look at if we were to go that direction, what are some of the laws and what are some of the measures we need to increase, uh, to put in place so that we can have a, a, a format of or increased uh, sustainability. The other thing we need to do is to enhance centralization, to leverage economies of scale, and to increase the plasma pool for future fractionalization. And what, what we also mean then that when we have a central way of system, we will not have wastage so that we can, some people have more blood than they need, others don't have blood. So you will find that movement uh, that movement can cause, if we had a way to centralize it so that it is following on the same route, we can track all the uh, units everywhere, then it would make the, um, the process efficient and uh, there will be usage, appropriate usage of what is available. 
Next. So, at present, the cost of blood and blood products at Kenyatta are largely borne by the hospital. Literally, we carry the burden. We carry the burden of uh, acquiring the blood. We carry the burden of uh, uh, giving the blood uh, in terms of uh, transfusion. However, this may not be sustainable even in the near future because these are changing and changing times. And um, these have ended up overweighing uh, the system uh, in terms of uh, the supply, in terms of uh, also, you will find the patients stay longer because of, of um, uh, inadequate amount of blood. Some operations have to be deferred. And sometimes we, there is a delay in initiation of some treatment. For example, the, for the sickle cell and the cancer treatment, uh, and even when we want those uh, blood products again, if we had to put the actual cost so that each cost is one one to one, then some of these things would be would be avoided. And that's why we are saying we need to look at blood again. We need to ultimately look at all the costs so that we can slot them to a, a certain level of engagement so that we can we can avoid this element of uh, efficiency uh, inefficiency and shortage and so that we can also think about sustainable next so patient blood management kenyatta in addition to the extraneous role that, that my hospital does kenyatta also uses alternative to allogenic transfusion these are we have used it to reduce uh, the risk of exposure to transfusion, transmissible infection, unnecessary blood use, and mitigate the clinical blood shortage in our center. This is what is done in all centers of excellence, of where we are not an exceptional. When we must not use blood, we have all those alternatives that we are using. Next. So how do we enhance accountability in the Kenya blood ecosystem? As we, as, as Kenyatta Society, we welcome the proposed blood establishment computer system. We are more than willing to engage in it and it will improve the transparency in blood collection and supply. We, are, we should even be thinking about movements of even drone. We want to use, like in, in India, they are, they are using, they can track the way we track Uber. The way you can track your Uber is coming in two minutes, in five minutes. They have a system where you can actually track where the satellite system, where you can actually know where the blood is. And this is some of the things. These are, and as Stene was saying, we need to now bring in the ICT in it. We need to bring the new, new world uh, uh, way of doing things so that we can have uh, this efficient delivery of this commodity, including the movement of blood from one facility to the other using the drone system. We can like now, I would have no problem uh, sending with a drone uh, to KU hospital from Kenyatta when they need this rare, rare blood uh, types. These are some of the things we really need. And more so we need a, a comprehensive data system such that when I'm in my house, I can actually and enter that data as an administrator and I can see what needs to be done so that I don't have to wait until I'm given a phone call from Aga Khan that they need this blood uh, type agency. And these are some of the things uh, uh, we need. Then we also need to think about renewed energy, uh, renewed modern, modern way of doing things so that it will do along. With. So, uh, BTU and entire Kenyatta team look forward to continued engagement and strengthening the cordial working relationship with the KNBTS. Next. Uh, that that's, is my presentation. And uh, as, as I conclude, we want people to think out of the box. We want people to look at the law again. We want to people to look at the uh, blood now not as a free commodity. We want to put value in uh, this blood so that it can be. And although Celine Dion said the best things in life are for free, I still feel blood should not be free. Blood should be costed. Thank you, Chair, and uh, God bless. That's my presentation.
very much, Dakshari, for that very insightful presentation. I'm very sure that um, uh, fellow participants uh, like myself lack words to describe that presentation because um, it will linger in, on, in our minds so much, especially on the cost of blood and um, also um, the cost of blood versus value of life. So um, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, presentation um, has really enlightened us. Uh, Dr. Ari, we thank you and appreciate you, especially when you give us that uh, bird's eye view of a manager uh, uh, and, and also as an administrator and also as a doctor. So thank you very much. Uh, as we, you've just put it that um, KNH is um, more than ready to collaborate with the Kenya National Blood Transfusion Tissue and Human Organ Transplant uh, Department uh, on the issue of um, uh, blood management information system. Uh, this gives us hope and also we also uh, wish to engage more uh, on this. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari, and uh, welcome uh, for finding time to be with us uh, out of your very busy schedule. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harry. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go back to uh, uh, Dr. Sitene, um, uh, who uh, as uh, he was presenting. Uh, Dr. Sitene, uh, good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Yes, so please guide me on the slide, which uh, we got stuck at. Yeah, yeah, just put the slide show and move. I'll tell you the slide that you are at. You can't see my slides, eh? Yes, I can see we were, at, uh, we were at going beyond slide five. Is it that one? Are you seeing something? Are you able to see something? Yes, Dr. We can, we can see your slide in health technologies in Kenya. And I think we, 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 had, we had already gone past that. Let me go to the next. Yeah, we were on the table, slide number seven. That one. Yes, yes. So what I was saying is that uh, there have been a lot of attempts. I'm sorry that uh, there was a problem with the connectivity. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, attempts and uh, these attempts have led to many disparate health solution systems, which as you can see on your left slide uh, are available, but uh, not properly used on the right side. And uh, the next slide is just to demonstrate that uh, we now have a vision where we need to develop a comprehensive integrated uh, digital system that exceeds expectations of Kenyans. And a lot has been done towards this. Uh, in any case, now we have a lot that you'll be seeing because uh, Dr. Jared will be presenting. So my next slide is uh, just to demonstrate that uh, the health facilities that we have in Kenya, at the end of it all, we have to see how we can make sure that we have reached out to all those people, including 13,000 health facilities. And that is not going to be easy. It's a huge job, but yes, a lot of work has started and has, is going on. So in this slide, I was just, I'm just trying to demonstrate the fact that uh, we have a very good uh, working environment, both in terms of uh, legal and also in terms of uh, policies uh, and I will specifically figure out uh, the Health Act 2017 and the Data Protection Act and the fact that uh, the e-health bill is also going to address the challenges that have been now seen to do with the digitization of health facilities and the use of uh, technologies to resolve the challenges that we are facing. On the other side, we do have the agenda four, particularly the universal health coverage that we must be able to monitor. And the fact that uh, SARS-CoV-2, popularly called COVID-19, has woken us up. So specifically to go to the legal environment, 
the, this Health Act 2017 under Section 105 has given the ministry to develop and maintain a comprehensive integrated health information system. And that is what I wanted to say, that the law is very clear. Apart from making it mandatory now to report, the government has moved to seal the hole to ask the responsible ministry to develop and maintain a comprehensive integrated health information system that the ministry has now developed. And this is part of the discussions that we're going to have today to answer the questions that uh, Dr. Kamuri has also said that we must be able to leverage on the use of technology. On the flip side, the Data Protection Act 2019 is very specific and has classified the health data as being sensitive data. And the fact that this data cannot be transferred outside Kenya without the express permission of the data commissioner. So what the government has done is to develop a digital highway solution, which I will quickly go through. But I want to, to emphasize this national architecture for the sake of all of us to understand that the digital platform that the, the government has developed is going to cover first at the center of this slide from level one to level six. In other words, it's modular, and you will see that slightly later. And one of the modules that we have interacted with and we know is the module that we call Chanjo KE. So that is a work that has already been done, and it's one of the modules that we are going to roll out. In total, we have more than 63 modules that are going to be rolled out. The second module is this module on blood management information system that Jared will be talking about uh, in a few minutes from now. And then we already have the uh, community uh, information system that is already being piloted in Kisumu and already being used in uh, Isiolo. So those are some of them that uh, are going to be rolled out. And we already have all these modules basically ready from that can cover from level one, which I've talked about, all the way to level six, where Dr. Kamuri sits. On the right-hand side, the system will be in, in, uh, will be integrated with other existing databases that are of importance, particularly NIMS. This is the so-called the Huduma number for purposes of ensuring that that particular patient or that particular client, maybe that blood donor, when they say they are called uh, gems, it is actually that gems and not any other gems for purposes of tracking and also providing comprehensive care. On the left side you can see that the system will be integrated with the non-state actors uh, and here we are talking about the private hospitals standalone health facilities uh, that may be out there for imaging lab services it is also going to be integrated with the financial systems so that patients can be able to be able to transfer funding or money if they have to pay for particular services and also the insurance industry and already we are integrating the system with nhif so that seamlessly NHIF can be able to see what is happening to a particular patient and, and the flow of that particular patient. And uh, as we move ahead, you will see that this system will be holistic. And I will be talking about that slightly later. That is the infrastructure that you'll be able to see. But specifically in terms of the system, this is the platform that we are talking about. The solution is already up and running and part of the solution is being deployed in the blood transfusion uh, management information system as one of the modules. The infrastructure is what the government is laying as number two, and I will talk about this as a, as a response by all the government approach. And then of course, the biggest challenge will remain at the end user in terms of uh, training the healthcare workers and providing the required infrastructure that will be needed. So the solution itself, provides for uh, uh, clinical decision support systems from entry to exit. That means the moment a client or a patient visits a health facility at all service delivery points, that particular patient will be having their data digitized. And the patient does not need to carry any form of uh, paperwork. They only need to know their names and their, uh, and their form of identification, other forms of identification, be it biometric or any other form, so that even when the client moves through that continuum of care, they only move to the next level, be it imaging, be it lab, be it whatever, and the queue will be managed by the system, and they'll be able to see. 
the system is also integrated is uh, has the the ICD 11 already uh, in, engraved in it so that we can classify our diseases according to the international standards and that clinicians will not have now challenges with the coding or even classifying disease sometimes we have clinicians using things like suspected malaria or things like those that may not necessarily exist but now with the integration with the onboarding of the ICD 11 into the system it is very easy for the clinician to really classify diseases according to the international classification. It will provide for data analytics. So this is where you'll be able to visualize any form of reports at any service delivery point and also automated indicator repeating and also ensure interoperability, as I've said, with other systems, including KEMSA, NHIF. Hopefully at the end of this system, once it is deployed in all the health facilities, we'll be able to know, and Dr. Kamuri will be able to know in his facility, how much of what commodity is consumed per day, per week, or per month. It will assist us now to be able to plan much more effectively because we will know how much we need of what. The system is configured in such a manner that even when the, the, the stock control levels fall below the agreed levels, it sends an alert to whoever is supposed to act so that that person makes sure that uh, the required resources do not fall below a certain level within the health facility. And that also includes, for example, if there is need to have a stock control level for blood and its products, it will be the same. In addition, this system will be able to provide all these advantages that we've talked about. But more importantly, this is a patient-centric system. It is not a system that focuses on the clinicians. It focuses on the patient. And as you can see in the Chanjo system, that most of us have interacted with. You have the patient portal or the client portal where you are able to update, to register yourself, be able to, to see what you have received, which date in terms of the COVID-19 vaccine. You are also able to download your, your certificate. So that portal will be expanded so that the, clean, the patient at home can be able even to upload their blood sugar levels, be able to track their blood pressure within the system and also be able to book or even to see who is the nearest gynecologist or surgeon that they are interested in. And because the system is also going to be integrated with the, uh, the professional associations and the, and the regulatory bodies, the system will also take care of uh, quality of care by making sure that those who have not received their, their CPD points and they are officially registered the way they should be, then the system will recognize that and shut you out. Overall, it will, include, it will improve on financial collection, as I've talked about. It will account for staff time because the people will be able to sign in at individual level and many others. In addition, the system will also be able to have much more than what I've put here in the sense that the system will be expanded even to capture um, issues to do with operations. But presently, as I said, the outpatient modules and the inpatient modules and the special clinics are ready. We have also made ready the platform for telemedicine and already there is a, a, a pilot and I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Kamuri for this between Isiolo County and the uh, Kenyatta Hospital. This has been running. It was supposed to have been launched. You have few... five minutes. Yes, I'm moving very fast. So it should, should have been uh, launched a few minutes ago. This telemedicine platform is part of the digital platform. The platform will be riding on the NOFB, which is the National uh, Fiber Optic Network, and all health facilities are getting connected through this. This is already ongoing process through the enabler ministries, and Ministry of ICT is taking care of that. We have the data center where all the data will now be domiciled, ready and up and running with 100 gigabytes per second connectivity and a storage capacity at the moment of 500 terabytes uh, with the power connectivity, which is already in place. We'll also have this flow of the data now, slightly changing because most people are used to DHIS. Now we are moving towards patient level data and you can see how that patient level data will be flowing towards the national data center. And then from the national data center through the end-to-end -end digital health platform, the statistics will now be pushed to DHIS. We are going to use different types of models to roll out depending on availability of digitization. So we have three models in place. 
And as I say, this is a whole of government approach. Ministry of ICT is rolling out the fiber. Ministry of Energy is connecting power. Ministry of Road is doing the network. The Ministry of Health has already set up the data center, is already procuring the end-to-end -end user equipment, and the solution is already up. We are also going to address the challenges as we move ahead because we expect that each and every one of us who is here and others who may not be here have a role to play. We've learned a lot and we've known that uh, we can be able to move ahead. So uh, we have uh, developed the system. It is out there. It should be used. And once it is used, it is our belief that we'll be able to move away from the paper-based systems, uh, as we have now demonstrated, to make Kenya a healthy, productive, and globally competitive nation. Thank you. I hope I did not uh, spend more than the five minutes which were allocated to me. And thank you. And uh, wish as well in our deliberations. Over. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sitene, for that very insightful presentation and uh, for also explaining to us um, and uh, our participants on uh, what uh, what uh, we have going forward to the future. And uh, also uh, for highlighting the importance of data at this particular point and also the legal um, uh, issues surrounding data. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari, for also for your leadership. And uh, I'm, we are very encouraged that uh, this, with this kind of uh, move, we are going to have uh, efficient provision of healthcare services in the country. And especially for us in the blood service, we are very happy and uh, encouraged. Thank you very much. Um, our colleagues and uh, participants, allow me welcome uh, Mr. Jared Donzomu. Jared Donzomu is an ICT expert at the Ministry of Health. And uh, he's going to take us through now the, the, the technical bit of uh, uh, the Damu Year 2 system, which is the blood management information system. Ibusana Jared, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tulev, uh, for the opportunity, and uh, to everyone uh, participating in this uh, uh, conference. Um, my name is Jared Ansom, as Tulev has introduced me. And uh, I'm here to discuss on ways of uh, really eliminating uh, Kenyans uh, dying for lack of blood in the country. And so uh, how do we achieve this? Uh, we are looking at uh, reducing uh, the turnaround time uh, between uh, the point where blood is donated to the point where the blood is uh, transfused to the patient. So that is really the target. I think that is the aim of everyone in this uh, conference. Uh, to ensure that, that uh, no Kenyan out there dies because of lack of blood. So, uh, proceed to the, so this is my presentation outline. I'm going to do some bit of background. I cover the objectives of why we need the Damietu. Uh, what are some of the design considerations we put when we came up with the solution and uh, some of the core features uh, that uh, we've developed in the Damietu system. So as we know, uh, blood is, uh, is a precious element that uh, really sustains life. We know that uh, in Kenya, we usually say, imagine why. And I think uh, at this point, I could also want to say damu ni why. Actually, damu, uh, blood actually drives life. So it's a precious element. And therefore, uh, it's, it, it's important as a country, then uh, we see how best uh, we avail this blood to whoever wants it. Uh, so, as you know, again, um, blood is always required uh, when we are giving uh, various uh, healthcare services, and some of these include surgeries, treatment of cancer, acute and chronic medical conditions, trauma care, and even uh, when uh, uh, our mothers are uh, delivering. So, I, I was actually informed when I was interacting with the users uh, that uh, there are some conditions whereby if uh, especially when uh, uh, our mothers are giving birth, uh, when they start bleeding, then there's no medication. The only thing is that there must be a blood component that must be transfused to these uh, uh, ladies for them, for the blood to stop uh, bleeding. So you can imagine how important uh, blood is, how precious it is to us. So it means that uh, with blood transfusion, then you are able to save lives and uh, improve, uh, improve health of our citizenry. And uh, the, the challenge that we are facing is that uh, our patients uh, who are requiring the transfusion do not have uh, timely access to safe blood. I mean, not just access to the blood, blood must be safe. 
So, and that's why we are here to see how then do we uh, bridge this gap so that then blood is really availed in a timely manner and in a safe manner to our patients. It's uh, uh, WHO is, uh, has recommended that uh, uh, as a country, we need to have a minimum of 1% uh, of blood uh, units, 1% uh, of the population of blood units in the country. So then we also need to devise ways of how to mobilize blood in the country to ensure that we are able to achieve uh, the requirement that, uh, that has been recommended by WHO. So for us to bridge this gap uh, technologically, uh, we've come up with the WHO system, which is a blood management information system that automates all the activities related to blood collection, testing, processing, storage, and distribution. And the key objective of this system is really to enhance efficiency, effectiveness, and safety of blood services management in the country. So safety is very important here, even in as much as we are looking at the efficiency and effectiveness, so that at the end of the day, then we don't again uh, go ahead and infect uh, uh, our patients with the diseases, especially the DTIs that are normally screened when, uh, when we are testing uh, the, uh, the donated blood. So Damietu will actually promote uh, effective track and trace of blood from the donor vein to the recipient vein. This is very important. And this one will also bring about the accountability of donated blood. Because uh, at the moment, uh, there are claims that uh, blood is being sold. Um, and sometimes the claims may not be true. But with a system that we are able to track blood from vein to vein, then even the health workers who are involved in this space, they can be able to account actually that no blood that is being sold. So it's going to work for both, both sides. So, so for the management and for the health workers, where we are able to account. And then in, in that manner, then um, it brings about the trust and the transparency that is needed in the management of this blood. With the system, you are going to keep track uh, of all the, the donors uh, in the system in a database. And with that uh, database, then we'll be able to actually, in case of an emergency, then we're able to mobilize these people. We know we have these, uh, we have these rare blood, blood, uh, blood types. And of course, um, in the case of an emergency, uh, we are able, now that we have the information of all the donors in the system, we are able to do mobilization through bulk SMS uh, uh, broadcasting to our uh, donors in the system. And of course, we could, we'll also be able to do targeted uh, mobilization whereby, uh, whereby uh, you, can, you can actually target a particular region, uh, targeting a particular blood group. That way then you, you reduce the turnaround time uh, when we are mobilizing for these uh, blood. Then again, the system that is also going to help us to monitor the available blood in the country so that you're able to know at any given time whether there's need to act, uh, whether there's need to uh, carry out the drives that are needed because maybe the blood levels has gone below the required uh, uh, minimum. And so with this one at a click of the button, with the system in place, you're able to tell the available blood, which type, where, in which region, in which particular facility. And therefore then, based on that information, then you're able to make uh, accurate decisions in terms of how then do you mobilize people to be able to now to maintain the uh, required amount of blood in the country. Then again, with the system again, you'll be able to enhance rational distribution depending on the demand of the blood from one region to another. Then out of this, we'll be generating in the entire process of uh, blood correction, testing, processing, and storage, you'll be able to, we'll be collecting uh, data. And this data, we're going to generate reports for decision making and uh, policy formation. This is very important to guide so that then you are making decisions based on informed uh, uh, facts. And, and of course, out of the decision will lead into a coming up formulations that will help in uh, enhancing service delivery in as far as blood management is concerned. And with the system, again, it's going to help us with the policies that have been um, formulated to implement them and have them enforced. Because then the system is, is going to force people to do things in a particular manner. So it's going to help the management to be able to ensure that whatever policy that they've come up with, whatever regulations that they've come up with, they are actually implemented and they are properly enforced. So what are some of the design considerations we took into consideration we are coming up with the Damietu system. One of them is the multi-tenancy uh, aspect. Uh, this is very important because 
we are incorporating all the stakeholders involved in this space. So all the facilities that are involved, all the entities that are involved in the blood management, they are going to be part of this system. So they are going to be registered and classified according, whether you are a transfusion facility, whether you are a collection uh, site, whether you are a blood bank. So all those will be registered and be maintained in a database within this facility. I mean, within this platform that you've come up with. Another consideration that we put into, uh, we considered is the uh, flexibility. The system is designed in such a way that it's flexible and dynamic enough to allow for, for, for configurability so that you can be able to change things on the fly. You don't have to uh, go back to the, to the developers or the software engineers to make changes in the system. You can be able to configure the system in a manner that then it's able to suit your needs. Uh, uh, in, in the environment within which you're operating. Another consideration is the open API. This is very important. This to allow the system uh, uh, to be uh, integratable with other systems. So as we speak, the system is ready to integrate with any other platform. And of course, you are going to integrate with other platforms like we are talking about the the Huduma number, which is very important for the unique identification. We are talking about the communication whereby we'll be broadcasting messages. We need to integrate with other third party solution for them to be able to send our SMSs to the, to the team. So we put this as a consideration so that then it becomes easier for our system to be able to talk to other uh, third party solutions. Even including the NHIF that you are talking about, the idea that uh, Dr. the CEO uh, KNH was talking about. So we'll be able to integrate with the uh, NHIF so that then we can allow the donors to, to, to get, to be covered by NHIF when they are donating. So with this uh, design then, it helps us then to have our system to really talk to other solutions. Then again, the system is designed in a way that is also scalable. We've used the microservices so that then we can scale horizontally without really affecting the performance of the solution. And in the case of uh, future enhancements, because as long as the system is, is being used, there will be enhancements that will be required. So the design allows for enhancement, adding more features into the system so that the system is actually talking to the needs of the user. So what are the key uh, functionalities of the system? One of them is the registration. This is where we capture the details of uh, uh, potential donors into the system. And um, what we are doing is uh, we are also going to provide a portal. Actually, we are finalizing on it by end of uh, next week, whereby now our donors should be able to uh, register themselves on the portal before they come to donation. This is very important again in terms of uh, reducing the turnaround time between donation to the trans to uh, having the blood transfused to the to the patient. Then again, under registration, you're also going to uh, do donor site recruitment. This is where we wherever we'll be doing uh, donation drives, we need to register all these so that at any given time, we're able to monitor and know where the drives are being conducted as a manager to provide the necessary support that is needed to ensure that the drives are successful as much as possible. So under donor registration, we capture specific information. We are talking about your identification details. And here, this is where we are going to integrate with the Uduma number so that you can uniquely identify the donor. <coughs> Sorry for that. Then you also capture your contact information. This is very important uh, because um, through the contact information, then we'll be able to communicate. We'll have a back uh, to and fro communication between the donor and uh, KNBTS. Then again, under registration, you also cap capture your physical location and, of course, next of kin details. These are very important in case of any event. For example, when you are donating, then um, there's an adverse event, uh, then we are able to reach out to your kins so that then they can respond to, uh, uh, to the call. That's why we capture all those. Those are the seg uh, data segments that we capture under registration. Then after registration, then this person moves to uh, donation management. This is where by now uh, we do uh, donor counseling. There's a form that is filled and we also capture the vitals of this uh, potential donor. This is very important so that then we are able to uh, uh, tell uh, the eligibility of this uh, donor. 
And at that point, we are able to tell whether this person can proceed to donate or can be de permanently deferred or can be temporarily deferred, just based on the data that has been captured at that point. Then, of course, the, the donor will proceed into uh, donation. Then uh, this is where the actual donation takes place. We are monitoring all this. The idea behind this is really to ensure that uh, um, uh, to ensure that um, uh, we are monitoring blood from vein to vein, that is from donor's uh, uh, vein to uh, recipient vein. So at every stage, once the blood is donated, we are able to track that this blood that was donated by this particular individual is at this point. And of course, during donation, there could be adverse events. So the system is also allowing for uh, tracking of these advanced events following that donation. This is very important. Once we capture this information, then we are able to tell that this individual maybe next time should not be allowed actually to donate. Uh, because now then if in case there's an event, then uh, we should not allow the patient next time to donate. So once you have this information, if he comes next time, we are able to tell that actually you are not eligible to donate blood. <laughs> then after that, uh, once the donation is done, then that information is moved to to the laboratory where now the screening is, is done to ensure to, to do the TTI testing. Then uh, the grouping is done and the component separation. If there is need for component separation, it's also done at that point. Then the blood, of course, the blood bags, the, the, the results will be sent to the inventory so that then we can allow for uh, sorting of this blood. As you know, once we've done the donation, the, the blood bags will be sent to the um, will be sent to the blood bank. And of course the vacutaneous will be sent to the lab for testing. So after the testing is done, then we move to the, the results are sent to the inventory uh, where they, so that then at that point we are able then to sort the blood uh, so that then we are able to tell this is safe for use and we mark them as safe for use or not safe for use. Those ones that are not safe for use then they are flagged for discard and the others will be stored now waiting for transfusion. And of course, we also have, we track the inventory in terms of the pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceuticals that are required during the donation drives. Then after that, then now we have the blood that is safe in our stores. Then we wait for the transfusion. Then at this point, we we will be having a, a registration of the uh, patients. Um, because we are talking about vein to vein. So we need to know that this blood is going to go to this particular patient. Then after we register the patient into the system, then we are going to have a, a requisition of this blood, requesting the blood from the blood bank. Then we do the cross matching that is required to ensure that uh, the two, uh, uh, there's compatibility between the donor and the recipient. Then once that one has been confirmed, then we move to the actual transfusion. And here, of course, then we go into now monitoring any adverse event uh, that might occur uh, out of that transfusion. Then there's another important component here with, that you're talking about the communication. It's going to do, uh, 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 it to be sending results uh, to the donors of their tests that will be carried out. Again, we are going to use communication for donation mobilization. Um, as I indicated, uh, we'll be able to target a particular region, a particular blood group, because now we have all that information within our system. And that's why when we are capturing the registration of these of donors, we are capturing the location, the physical location. So that then when we need to do actual uh, mobilization, I mean, targeting a particular location, based on the information that we capture that, that at that point, then we, we are able actually now to do that targeted uh, communication. Then of course, uh, we also need to acknowledge the transfusion, uh, uh, the, the donor after the transfusion has taken place. This is very important to tell the, the donor that actually the blood that you donated saved their life at some point. And this one actually will go a long way in, in encouraging our donors to, uh, to come back and donate more. Then after all these, through all this process as indicated, we are generating reports, which are very important. Uh, uh, I mean, we are generating uh, data, which then we use to uh, generate reports and uh, do analytics to inform us in our day-to-day -day operations, to help us uh, generate uh, and formulate uh, policies that will guide uh, the management of blood services in the country. Uh, then, 
So the milestones, what we've achieved so far, we've done the requirement analysis, design and development of the system. It is complete. We've done stakeholders engagement because at the end of the day, the system must serve the need of the user. So we have to make sure that the system conforms to the requirements of the user. And that's why we are doing this engagement to ensure that the system is properly aligned to the needs of the user. We've also done user acceptance testing. This is very important to ensure that then we validate the requirements that were given against, against what we've come up with. Uh, then we've also done the deployment. The system as we speak, it's live. If you go to wh2.health.go.ke, you can access the system. And now we are planning into now testing the system in a live environment before we scale up to the rest of the uh, facilities. So that's where we are in terms of uh, having this system. Then lastly, this marks the end of my presentation. Thank you for having me. Over to you, Bonatule. Thank you very much, Jared. Thank you very much for that very elaborate presentation on um, BMIS, that's Damu Yetu. And um, just key highlights that uh, this system will enable us to um, uh, track blood from uh, the vein of the donor to the vein of uh, the recipient, apart from also uh, enabling us to be able to mobilize blood donors and also communicate more with our blood donors. This will, in effect, um, encourage our blood donors to come forward to donate blood. That is uh, uh, also important to note that uh, we'll be able to generate reports which will uh, guide policy directions and also decision making so that uh, we are able to be a very efficient uh, blood transfusion uh, service in the country. Uh, something important also to note is that um, uh, from your presentation, we are also able to know that uh, blood uh, can be uh, traced and uh, from one vein to the next, and also uh, also be used as a national resource that we are able to see blood at uh, stocks in every part of the country, and also be able uh, to mobilize that blood to where it's needed uh, by our patients. Thank you very much, Mr. Jared. And um, at this point, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to go uh, to the question and answer section um, where we are going to address our questions and answers. I can see there are seven questions. And, uh, so I would also want to take this opportunity to thank our colleagues. We, I can see we have uh, 340 participants, 50 rising. So this means that uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, session that uh, all of us would want to have it go live and also utilize. So our request from our end is that um, as we go towards the launch of uh, the blood management for the system, that's the Damu Yetu, uh, the key point will be utilization. So thank you very much. And um, as I look at uh, our question and answer section, uh, I can see a comment from uh, David Quendo saying that, good morning, this is a great presentation. Thank you, thank you, David. I uh, also have a comment from uh, Dennis Matekwa saying, good morning all. Good morning, Dennis. Uh, we have James Mulunda who's asking in your view, what's the approximate cost of blood from donor to recipient? Um, uh, I think uh, Dr. Kamuri, the CEO of NHS, uh, this very clearly that uh, the cost in our situation here in Kenya is that um, the cost of blood is 10,000 shillings according to studies conducted. So I believe, uh, James, uh, your question has been answered. So uh, for Maurice uh, is asking, uh, issuing medical cover, to have, he's not asking actually, he's commenting that issuing medical cover for blood donors uh, is the sure bet forward to boost the national services. Thank you, Maurice. I think that's where we're looking forward to be and uh, be able to provide medical cover to all our blood donors. Then uh, Fanny Nelima says, thanks for the responses. Uh, Joshua Mosetti, uh, thing about donor, certif uh, donor certificates uh, from the small card that they are given, uh, I can confirm, Joshua, that um, the National Blood Transfusion Service, Tissue and Human Organ, Organ Transplant Service issues a donor certificate. And uh, we intend to make this better by uh, the entrance of our blood management information system uh, using e-cards that we can able to is even issue an e-certificate for you. So uh, he's quoting that from the experience by Dr. Kamuri, that is the Indian experience. 
uh, Brian Corbolo, uh, does it mean that the donor can also access this app? I uh, will request my colleague Jared to maybe respond to this. Uh, Jared, if you are still on. Uh, Brian is asking if uh, the donor can access this app. Jared, please, you can go ahead. Thank you, Sims. Jared, is, uh, I can confirm, uh, even as from the presentation made by Mr. Jared, that um, uh, donors can self-register, okay? So before you go to a blood establishment, you can actually register using your phone. Uh, this is a web-based uh, system that you can access using your phone and register as a blood donor. The only thing that remains to be done is now when you come to eligibility and also um, the health checks that you go through before donating blood. Uh, you will have to come for, uh, uh, say, uh, something like uh, checking, uh, checking your hemoglobin level, checking your blood pressure, and also uh, uh, that uh, eligibility criteria check that uh, will allow you to donate blood. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Bernard Odindo is saying that, can you share the Damu Yetu link? Yes, I think this, this can be shared. As soon as Jared comes back, we'll be able to share that link at uh, the website, uh, the Ministry of Health. So, um, do you have blood ecosystem in the, in the counties? To what extent are you able to serve the sub counties? Thank you very much, Odongo. Um, I think this is, this is a, a, a good question that. Um, I would have loved my colleague Jared, who is the who is, who is, who is, who is the ICT expert, to tell us. But as to what I already know is that um, that is where we are going to. Uh, we have blood establishments in all our counties. Uh, we are expanding to 47 counties and having a blood establishment to give each and every one of us um, uh, an opportunity to donate blood. And also, uh, Odongo, we uh, have a county collaboration uh, where we have the county blood transfusion uh, uh, coordinators who are available in our counties uh, to strengthen our blood county blood establishments and uh, also uh, uh, encourage and also support the blood uh, transfusion services in the counties. So for Mudoni, uh, I will, uh, she's asking uh, uh, that is interested in knowing what research synergies can be initiated on blood management. Uh, what are those key areas of data generation for decision making? These are very important question, Mudoni. And um, as we can see right now, we can share an experience of saying that after blood management for system deployment, we can share an experience and see how um, how it had been and how it to, uh, and it, how it has it has become after the the deployment of um, a blood management information system. So uh, blood uh, blood uh, um, uh, research uh, can be very important and uh, can also inform even epidemiological distribution of uh, blood uh, transfusion transmissible infections in the country. And uh, those are the areas that we look at inform in terms of research. And uh, maybe I can ask uh, Dr. CTNA, who is uh, whose docket this falls on, uh, if he can respond to that question on research. Uh, Dr. Ari, if you are still uh, on. Uh, if yes, I'm ask... on. What is the question again? Sorry, I missed yes. the question. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Um, Mudoni Mate is asking, um, what are the key areas on data generation for decision making, research on data generation uh, for decision making that are um, can be initiated in blood management. Uh, thank you very much for that question. I can see the question. Uh, the, of course, as we said, the system that has been developed will be collecting patient level data. So all the details of the client or the patient and the fact that now we are moving to the level of collecting patient level data, it also means that we can be able to do much more research beyond the traditional use of service statistics. So here now we can be able to see, for example, if it comes to blood uh, systems, uh, if you are looking at the research uh, compatibility, for example, and you are looking, looking something of that kind, it is now very possible to make sure that, uh, because you have the database of the clients, you can now do much more 
in-depth analysis. So to me, this is an opportunity to now expand our horizons when it comes to doing research of any form, not just for blood, but you can also be able to link it beyond blood. For example, because we are also linking the system to, to NHIF, we can even be able to track particular conditions through that system by creating a family tree. So you can even be able to see how uh, the resource factor is flowing in a family or hemophilia or whatever. This is very possible now with this system because it's completely comprehensive. I submit. Thank you, Dr. I believe uh, Modoni is answered. Uh, uh, Rispa Nyawira, I agree with you that um, the presentation on the cost of blood is was quite insightful, and uh, this is something that will carry going forward. And uh, with the insights from Dr. Kamuri, I think uh, we'll be able to have um, uh, further discussions and see how this can be handled going forward. So for Gaudencia uh, Afwande, uh, welcome Gaudencia. Uh, a colleague, Rogi Chumapili, from, uh, from Kuala Country, uh, is, 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 is asking, uh, as county blood management officers, we hope uh, the Damuneku will indicate expiry date for our management to be easy. Uh, this is very important, uh, Mr. Chumapili, that um, the Damuneku system will be able to um, indicate all the required data in terms of uh, blood unit uh, expiry and also be able to notify on near expiries. So um, for Evan Sumba, uh, how will the system students in most occasions don't use smartphones? The visit schools are time limited, have all the checks done on uh, to get eligibility requirements. I request my colleague Jared uh, to respond to this question from Evan Sumba. Mr. Jared? Please come up again with the question, sorry. Thank you. Uh, it's Evan Sumba who's asking, how will the system capture students' uh, uh, data who are in school in, uh, uh, also with the limited uh, timelines that we are given when we go for blood donation exercises in the schools? Okay, okay. So uh, I, I don't know that I've, answered, I've understood the question, but maybe how I can respond to that is... Uh, um, we, we have these recruiters eh, who go out to identify uh, potential uh, sites where we can carry out donation drives. So the idea after uh, uh, upon identification and agreeing that then we can conduct the donation drive, um, then th there will be need for registration. Uh, people will go there. Uh, the idea is uh, if they can be able to do it online and uh, they can be allowed to do it. But now this uh, now that they are under under age, may, they might not be having access to. If the, the school could be having the internet and all that, they could, they could be allowed to do the self-registration. They are guided, they are taken through by the recruiter and they do the self-registration. But if that is not the case, then we have these recruiters, once they go to the, to the site, they can do the actual registration of uh, these uh, donors before they do the donation. So that's how, uh, that's how it's going to take place. And maybe in terms of um, registration, you're going to use their, their school number, if they have the school uh, number, admission number, we can use that one as a, as a form of identification, or we can use their birth certificate number if they have it. But more importantly, once um, any uh, Uduma number becomes fully operational, then Uduma number will be able to answer all these questions. Then, in terms of uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, contacts. Uh, I think we'll be using, they'll be using their guardians, uh, our contacts uh, to provide as a form of uh, ways that we'll be using to reach out to them in case uh, we need to conduct uh, any drives or we are uh, requesting for them to, to come for the next uh, donation when they are due or, um, uh, or, or submit their results. So uh, we are going to use their kin's uh, contacts to be able to do that. I don't know that I've answered the question. Over to you, Bernard. Thank you, Jared. I, I think you've answered the question uh, from Evan Sumba. Aris uh, Panyawira, if I'd like to know in case of uh, donated blood was unsafe after screening, where, how exactly now we have to scheme will you notify the donor? So, um, Aris, 
thank you very much for the question. And I'll attempt to answer this question that um, uh, blood, when it's unsafe and uh, determined to be unsafe, um, and also, uh, it is also very important that we notify the donor because it will be injustice if we have someone having a certain infection uh, and, and not knowing. So um, the system will uh, send a message to ask the donor to come for their results, where now they'll be handled through the uh, donor, um, uh, donor notification processes at the International Blood Transfusion Service. So uh, they will be notified uh, just to come so that now they are consoled and referred to the next point of care. Thank you very much. Um, Just so, uh, ladies left. and gentlemen, yes. If, if I can add to that, uh, even at the point Sorry. where we are, sorry, uh, at the point where we are doing donor uh, counseling and uh, taking the vitals, if you realize that actually the person is, is based on what we've captured, is yeah, the indications are indicating that uh, the person is unwell. At that point, actually, we refer this um, uh, person to the hospital so that then he can seek uh, uh, medication. How about you? Jared, for that. So ladies and gentlemen, because of time, I think you may not be able to answer all the questions. I can see there are so many questions. Um, this opportunity now to welcome our speakers uh, to just, uh, if they have any additional comments uh, to, to our participants, uh, uh, over 300 participants and um, any take home message that you would like them to go home with. I think I'll begin with uh, uh, Evans Kamuri, if there's any comments that you wish to give to our participants. Welcome, Dr. Ari. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no much to say, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, people are taking blood seriously and I'm happy that we can have the efficiency in terms of delivery. Uh, blood is a problem and I'm not saying it will stop being a problem and uh, the area we take it seriously, the better. As a hospital and as part of the management, we will support hands in making the process efficient and uh, put a smile on Wanjiko's face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Curry, and uh, surely you'll put a smile on Wanjiko's face. Um, thank you. I, I will now move on to Dr. Sitene. Any comment or message for our participants? Thank you very much. I don't have much comments. I want to congratulate all of us. I think uh, the fact that there was more than 357 participants is a clear indication of a commitment. So I take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you and wish you a merry and enjoyable holiday. Thank you. Okay, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you. Uh, now we move to uh, Mr. Jared Donsomu. Thank you once again, Bwana Tudal. Mine is really to thank uh, the participant uh, for allowing us to make these presentations. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's now a responsibility to all of us uh, to ensure that uh, we, are, we are donating blood so that then this blood uh, saves our lives uh, at some point. So all of us are encouraged to donate uh, so that then we have enough uh, uh, blood in the country that then will be able to help us to stop people dying from uh, lack of blood. Thank you and have a Merry Christmas. How about you? Merry Christmas to you. Um, now I have this opportunity and um, privilege to welcome our head, the uh, Kenya National Blood Transfusion Service. Uh, Dr. Nduku Kilonso, uh, to make remarks. Welcome, Dr. Dr. you're breaking. Good afternoon, good uh, morning, good morning uh, presenters, good morning participants. Uh, thank you very much for
Daktari, we are not able to hear you. It's like you're breathing. Daktari, if you are speaking, you are mute. Oh. Uh, inviting. Uh, I don't know whether anyone can hear me. Yes, Dr. Terry, but you are breaking. You are breaking so much. Uh, maybe you can uh, move to a better network. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's like uh, our head Kenya National Blood Transfusion Service is uh, having a problem with her network. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to um, appreciate all our presenters uh, for that very wonderful uh, presentations that you've made. And um, I also wish to take this opportunity to um, appreciate uh, uh, all of us who've joined in, who found time to join in to, uh, to this uh, 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 webinar. And uh, also thank Kenya, Kenyatta National Hospital and uh, University of Nairobi for providing us with this opportunity to um, um, uh, 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 connect with our uh, colleagues and also uh, users of blood in the country. And um, we look forward to um, an improved uh, service that is uh, from our end as Kenya National Blood Transfusion Service uh, with the transformative agenda that we have as, um, um, uh, as a department of the Ministry of Health. Uh, we are sure that um, going forward and the kind of leadership that we have, uh, we are going to achieve a lot together. And um, at this point, I would like to maybe ask again if uh, our head Department of Kenya National Blood Review Service, Dr. Nduku Kilonzo, if she's uh, back. Okay, continue. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I hope you can uh, hear me. Yes, Dr. Perry, you're now clear. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I send my apologies. Uh, we are out of town in various meetings and so uh, sometimes the connection when is not so steady. Uh, I just want to uh, first of all say thank you very much to all our participants for having been here. My duty uh, this afternoon was uh, simply to ask uh, to call the peers to make her closing remarks. Unfortunately, she is chairing a meeting, a session meeting in which she still held up and because we have to finish, I think you will allow me to allow us to finish. Uh, uh, also not 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 being in, in, in the office, being out of office on different assignments. Uh, Dr. Kamuri, thank you very much for your presentation today. Dr. CTLA and Jared, uh, it's truly appreciated. I want to know that we've had over the last uh, six, uh, four weeks, a series of six sessions, starting with uh, um, really talking about our thinking of the future directions of the blood service, uh, transfusion service, particularly the blood ecosystem, recognizing that we also have transplant services that we are starting to develop a framework for. Uh, we have talked about systems, we have talked about hemovigilance, about quality management services, 
the status of where we are at. Now, I recognize we are not anywhere where we need to be, recognizing that uh, we have, uh, over the last one year, really embarked on change management. Having said that, I think there have been some gains, but more important is the lessons that have, are on the table for us to learn. Today's session, talking about the blood management information system, is really starting to say, um, how do we differently think about addressing the pain points in the health uh, uh, ecosystem as far as blood and, and components are concerned, which relates to maternal death, uh, people waiting in line for surgeries because they can't be done because of lack of blood, uh, which relates to uh, other deaths from road traffic accidents um, and mortalities uh, related to lack of availability ability of, of uh, this very, very critical human-derived medicine that we have. I think today's uh, discussions around cost and value are very much needed because we really have to start to think about the cost and value. Uh, moving forward, in addition to some of the things we have said, the purpose of having this series was to do a number of things. The first was to provide information. Uh, two was to provide a capacity building session uh, for, for those of us. But importantly, it was a blood service to get feedback and have participation of stakeholders on the directions we are going, whether they make sense, what does not make sense. But also, where is it that we can do better and we need to focus on? And we really learned a lot from this session and we want to thank you. I want to thank all the participants who have been here. I want to thank all the presenters, not just today, but also the last few days. Importantly, we are doing this because we want to have all our patients um, uh, taken care of. As far as today's session is concerned on the question around data and around reporting and analytics, I want to note that uh, the ministry, uh, the peers appointed a monitoring, a surveillance monitoring and evaluation working group national for blood, uh, uh, um, uh, blood, blood transfusion services. And we are developing one, obviously, the, the, the data, the, the indicator reference matrix, which is going to uh, the BMIS. So we will stop having to fill in papers and we'll be able to automatically generate this report. And secondly, we have a second work stream, which is looking at surveillance. Surveillance will help us identify where our most, uh, you know, where our bleeding and blood disorders are, and therefore what sort of components or, or or volumes of blood and components that we need to take there. Surveillance will give us some annual indicators uh, on things that may be coming up in the health sector that uh, blood can help answer. For instance, the other day I got a question, are we having increase of syphilis? Because we are seeing that in some facilities, uh, we just want to know what the blood data says and those kinds of things. And surveillance will also help us be able to determine where it is that, uh, what, where it is that we need to get our services. So with those many remarks, I want to uh, say thank you to all the participants. Wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And thank you all, Asanteni, Sana, Sana, Sana. And uh, Dr. Kamuri, thank you, the presenters of today's PNA and, uh, and, and uh, Jared, um, and again to all the participants. We don't take your time for granted. Asanteni, Sana, to the KNH webinar, KNH OL uh, webinar platform and working team, Secretariat, that has been with us and has supported us. As always, reminded us what we need to go and what we, we are routines that we need to be moving forward. We wish to thank you all very, very, very much. We wouldn't have done this without you, and we wouldn't have been able to actually get where we need to go. Dr. Pranila and your team, uh, the team that is from the uh, UN, uh, I want to thank Dr. Lois for the feedback that we have received. Really, it has been helping us make the things better. Asanteli Sana and Kwaherini. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sri. I think now uh, we can all live at our own pleasure. Thank you very much and uh, Happy New Year.